Welcome. Welcome and good evening. We thank you for coming to what promises to be an intriguing and interesting conversation with author Geraldine Brooks. We are so very glad you're here. However, before we begin our discussion, I want to recognize a few people of Pasadena. First, to add his welcome and to share his thoughts, our own Bill Bogard, a man who not only has a great track record as a mayor, but has an even better track record as an avid re reader and a voracious book lover. We welcome him to the podium and look forward to his remarks. Mayor Bogard. Thank you, Jan, and good evening, everyone. I consider it a great privilege to uh, have this opportunity to join Jan Sanders in extending a welcome uh, to this culmination of the 2012 One City, One Story. Thank you for being here, and I hope that you are all as proud of this program as I am. Uh, because it reflects Pasadena as a city that celebrates arts and culture and pursues the building of our community through activities that bring people together. The year 2012, this year, marks the 10th anniversary of this community reading program. It was established to promote the enjoyment of reading by selecting uh, one book each year that invites the community to read it and to engage in a community conversation. Uh, one City, One Story has done just that year after year, sparking great discussions and open dialogue of important issues raised by the particular book. The idea of drawing the community together to discuss a single book first arose in the cities of Seattle and Chicago and quickly spread to Pasadena and across the country. The idea in promoting a community dialogue is not to all agree, but to exchange thoughts and comments, and in sharing, we all learn. You probably know that the One City, One Story program gets started in February or March, with all sorts of sessions being uh, presented. There are book discussions throughout the community in churches, stores, and libraries. Colleges and schools sponsor related events like panel discussions, art shows, concerts, and lectures. The author was at PCC talking to 200 students today, and she'll visit Polytechnic tomorrow, as well as Caltech. Colleges, uh, lots of people get involved. What is wonderfully encouraging is the extent to which uh, more and more persons and organizations have become involved in One City, One Story, both through financial support and participation in programs and activities. I wanted to spend just a moment on how uh, each book is selected on this 10th anniversary of One City, One Story. Usually in late summer, about 15 community readers begin meeting to suggest titles for the selection uh, the following spring. There is a long list of criteria that are carefully brought to bear by those who work on this committee. And I want to mention just a couple. One is that the author is expected to uh, come to Pasadena uh, for a participation in One City, One Story activities. Another is the work should appeal, the work, the, the book should appeal to many members of our community, women, men, teens, readers, uh, and so forth. Uh, the broader the appeal, the richer the discussion. The book should also inspire a conversation. It should start people thinking and encouraging and sharing of ideas. The important point is that this group of community volunteers is called upon to acquaint themselves with a large number of possible books 
um, so that a thoughtful selection can be, uh, take place before the end of the year. The goal is to make a selection in time to announce in November, giving ample time uh, to Pasadena residents to start reading the book, as well as to give the title as holiday gifts. Without prolonging my time at the microphone, I would like to celebrate this 10th anniversary by spotlighting the persons who served on the community committee this year. Just quickly, Brian Beery, Rosemary Choate, Kimberly Douglas, Brenda Galloway, Sandy Greenstein, Sally Cooser, Fred Messick, Christine Reeder, Jan Sanders, Susan Schmidt, Amy Ulmer, Jolly Erner, Larry Wilson, Akita Winslow Tyler. Let's give them a hand. <clears throat> Everyone knows that the book selected this year is People of the Book, inspired by a true story of a mysterious and ancient volume knowing as the Sarajevo Haggadah. It is an adventure sweeping through five centuries of history, from its creation in the then Muslim-ruled medieval Spain. The illuminated manuscript makes a series of perilous journeys through Inquisition-era Venice, turn-of-the-century Vienna, and the Nazi sacking of Sarajevo. I am sure everyone here has read the book and has all of these details well in mind. It is now my pleasure to introduce the director of the Pasadena Public Library, Jan Sanders, who will introduce our honored guest, the author of People of the Book, Geraldine Brooks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We appreciate your being here, and we really appreciate your support for this program throughout its entire 10-year history. Um, it's, very, it's good to have you here. Thinking about when we started 10 years ago, we first began right here at All Saints Church. Not here in the sanctuary, but across the lawn in the forum. I wasn't present. I, that was before my time and Pasadena had begun. And I don't pretend to know what the thinking was in doing that, but I'm pretty sure it had something to do with the incredible involvement and commitment to community that this church fosters. So tonight we return to our origins as we celebrate a decade of presentations for One City, One Story. Our thanks to All Saints for their continued support and for the generous use of their space once again. And to offer his own inimitable style of welcome, the leader of this place, the Reverend Ed Bacon, rector. Thanks, Jan. Welcome, Pasadena. We are thrilled to have you here. All Saints has fostered so many important programs, and we are so happy to be under girding and welcoming One City, One Story. We're thrilled to have Geraldine Brooks in our midst. Great, it's a great event to have the mayor here, and it's a marvelous experience to have all of you in this room. And I must brag just a little bit on the fact that Jan Sanders is not only a member of All Saints Church, but she's on the Board of Governors, the vestry. All Saints lives to make life for the city much, much better. We do hope that you'll come back and visit us. This room is open daily for meditation and prayer. So many people who are struggling with life come and find a place of solemnity and serenity here. Um, we are a, a place for all people, for all faiths, for people without faith. We're radically inclusive, and we're very, very happy that you're here tonight. Welcome. The mayor did a fine job of recognizing the members of the committee and sharing with you a bit of what goes into our thought processes as we pull these titles together. 
Um, the part he didn't tell you is that we often start with as many as 47 to 60 titles. Yes, 47 to 60. Uh, and we whittle that down through careful deliberation and thought and um, uh, discussion, sometimes argument, all well-founded, um, until we come away with the final five or six or seven or how many, however many we have at the end of the day. Then each member of the committee reads all of those titles uh, in order to cast their vote for what then becomes the official One City, One Story title. So we, um, we come together joyously and it is a, it's, it's a wonderful experience to work with that group, although um, I must tell you that sharing a group of 15 very strong-minded, very opinionated, very erudite people um, takes some chocolate sometimes. <laughs> take some chocolate. I must call out one particular member of the library staff to you tonight, though, uh, and that is our own Christine Reeder. Christine is the primary program developer for all of the events that you see listed in the, in the brochures about One City, One Story. She continues to work her magic in ferreting out the themes and the subjects for One City, One Story, and then transforming those into an amazing array of activities and lectures and musical productions and all sorts of opportunities. We would like to thank her publicly. Christine, would you stand and let us acknowledge you? She's way in the back. Thank you. And now, enough of that. Let's get down to the reason that we're here this evening. We are honored to welcome Geraldine Brooks to the platform tonight. Ms. Brooks, as most of you know, is the author of a number of books, including the Pulitzer Prize winning novel, March, which is based, if you're not familiar with it, on the backstory behind uh, Alcott's uh, novel of Little Women. Now, I don't know about your story and your heritage, but I grew up in a family of three daughters. So with one more, we could have been the March girls, I suppose, but we didn't do that. So there were three of us, and, and so almost without fail, someone was reading Little Women at some point of the summer. And we, all, we often wondered, what about the dad? Where did he go? He had to play some part in this whole drama. So I was very happy to read um, Ms. Brooks' rendition of, of what Mr. March was actually like. So if you get a chance to read March, I think you will, you will enjoy it immensely. And the first time I met Geraldine Brooks as an author was in reading her book, Year of Wonders, which is set in the plague years in England. And it's a fascinating story about a village that undergoes voluntary um, uh, quarantine in order to stop the spread of the, of the dreaded plague. And, and that book, I think, maybe, maybe not more than the others, but certainly equally with the others, really highlights her skill and adeptness and integrity of research. We really... So you think about March that had to do with the Civil War, which I'm guessing got some, some um, buy-in from other people in her family. If you don't know, um, Ms. Brooke is married to uh, Horowitz, who wrote uh, um, Confederates in the, in the Attic, which is a Civil War kind of thing. Um, so she wrote about the C Civil War. She wrote about time um, during the plague. And she's written this new book, which takes us through a number of ages. So we're sensing a theme. And the theme, of course, is historic fiction. In addition to that, however, she also served as an outstanding correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. And she was stationed in Bosnia, Somalia, and the Middle East. And we'll touch on that a bit tonight as well. But surely all of these experiences and all of this training and forethought comes together beautifully in the subject of our conversation tonight people of the book. And that is the reason we are gathered. Would you please help me welcome Geraldine Brooks. Good 
Good evening. Good evening. It's wonderful to be back in Pasadena in this absolutely magnificent church. I, di I didn't know that you had had any um, history of Pasadena, but I learned that today, so that was, that was fun. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Oh, it's uh, the, the um, gravitational pull of Romans, which every, <laughs> every author feels, and uh, it's really one of my favorite bookstores in the world. I'll share that with Joel Sheldon next mm -hmm. time I see him. <clears throat> That'll be fun. Well, I think uh, uh, everyone that I've spoken to um, has really enjoyed your, uh, your book, People of the Book, and it, it speaks to a lot of different themes that are, that are interesting and, and intriguing to all of us, but particularly, I think we're intrigued by the whole idea of the Haggadah, and, the, and the, particularly the Sarajevo Haggadah, which has its own sense of mystery and fate. Talk to us a little bit about what pulled you to that subject. I stumbled on this subject a long time before I thought about writing a novel, a long time before I was a novelist, in fact, when I was <laughs> still very much involved in the day-to-day -day business of journalism. I was a correspondent for the Wall Street Journal, and at this particular point, my job was the UN correspondent, and I was in Sarajevo during the siege of the city because the UN's role there was quite controversial. And I was working on that, and at that time, there was only one hotel functioning in the damaged besieged city, and that was the rather inaptly named Holiday Inn. <laughs> Not so much. Not so much Holiday. <laughs> Not so much Holiday. And yeah. also, when you checked in there at that time, you really didn't want to be asking for a room with a view, because every window had been shut out, and if you could see the beautiful mountains that rise, like the sides of a bowl sheltering the city, then the snipers and the artillerymen on the mountains could see you. So um, There was no electricity, but somehow they managed to open the bar every night for the journalists. And, um, it's about priority. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes there was even ice. <laughs> but anyway, journalists would retreat there, usually in a pretty bad way, because most of what we were reporting on was so tragic and horrifying, even for pretty hardened um, war correspondents. But this night, the talk turned not to the atrocities of the day, but to this mysterious missing volume from the Bosnian National Museum, which mm -hmm. was just across the road from the Holiday Inn. And nobody knew where this illuminated Hebrew book had got to, and journalists love gossip, so everybody had a theory. and. One of my colleagues said that the Muslim government had sold it to buy weapons, and another said, no, that wasn't true. It was clear that Mossad had come from Israel, and they'd um, basically taken the book out through a tunnel under the Sarajevo airport to safety in Israel. And I filed all this away, and I thought, that's pretty interesting. I must check into that, but way leads on to way, and I never did get to check it out. And then it was right at the end of the war, uh, when the book re-emerged at the Jewish community's communal Passover Seder. And as many of you probably know, and some of you will be celebrating one in the next week or so, uh, the Seder is the family um, meal at which the story of the Exodus is retold. Uh, generally speaking, for the benefit of children, because it says in the Bible, you shall teach this to your children on that day. And so every Jewish family gathers and there are traditional foods and so forth, and the Haggadah is the book that you use to tell the story. And so they brought this book out, and the true story of what had happened to it was revealed, and that was even more extraordinary than any of the journalist theories and that was that a Muslim librarian had risked his life and gone in under intense shelling in the early days of the war to bring this book to safety. And when I heard that, then I was really interested, and even more so when I learned that this wasn't the first time this Jewish book had been saved 
by Muslim hands that a, another Muslim librarian had saved it from the Nazis in World War II. And that got me off and running. So when I made the shift from journalism to novel writing, this story was very much on my to-do list. Well, we appreciate, those of us in the profession appreciate the nod you gave to thanking librarians at the beginning of the book. That was very kind. <laughs> we'll, well, we'll take that. We'll take that. Well, you know, one of the, one of the really horrible things that happened early in the siege of Sarajevo was the deliberate targeting of the Bosnian National Library. And that book with its incredible collections of Ottoman manuscripts and early Slavic documents was targeted with phosphorus bombs, so it became an inferno, and librarians risked their lives to evacuate those books. And one of them, a young woman named Ada Baturovic, was killed in that endeavor that night. I remember that. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever find yourself, however, sort of conflicted in terms of your role as a novelist and your role as a journalist? Is it hard to to sort of bring those together? Are they naturally exclusive? Oh, no. I mean, I think I'm still feeding on my years as a foreign correspondent every time I sit down to write a novel because there was an intensity of experience during those years and certainly saw and lived through a lot um, that for a long time I deliberately tried not to think about too much because it was too painful, but I do go there and draw on it for the writing of fiction. Um, and the toolbox of journalism is very useful, and I like to follow the line of fact as far as it leads. And then when the factual record falls silent, that's when the imaginative endeavor begins. And the voices come. Yes. Then you get the voice of the book. Yeah. Great. That's great. Um, I'm going to ask you kind of a serious question because this book, um, although a wonderful story in itself, really brings up some important truths about us as human beings, I think. Um, in your story, we're reminded that there was once a time of accord and general tolerance, if not out and out harmony between Muslim, Jew, and Christian in medieval Spain. Uh, that time, called the Convivencia, brought an onset of a shared culture, an appreciation of language, a depth of tolerance that we should be so lucky as to replicate today. And yet in the story, we're also reminded that often there surfaces that evil again. It never completely goes away. Whether it's the Inquisition or the Nazi horrors or the things that are happening in Toulouse, France, even today, that badness that's part of our human nature, unfortunately, resurges. And yet, you have been able to reassure us of humans' innate goodness. And you have shown us that sometimes it is an uncommon act of valor from a very common person who drives us forward. And I just would like for you to talk to us a little bit about, about how you came to that, that truism and how did you sort of integrate that? Did that, that sort of became the central idea of your book? Yeah, and I... That's just my interpretation. Yeah, no, Maybe not for you, but just for me. No, I think it emerged to me as I was writing it that that was pretty much where it was going because the fact is that every time we do create multicultural societies where there's mutual respect and a willingness to enjoy and learn from the riches of each other's cultures, that's when we move the ball forward. That's when science and art flourish and we get things done as a species. And then it's like a quiescent virus or something, this horrible urge to demonize the other rises up again and we smash those beautiful things apart, and it takes centuries to get back to the same. I mean, I, don't, I think you could argue that Spain never really got back after the Inquisition and the expulsion of all the Jews and Muslims. Or at least it took centuries for them to crawl back out of the hole that they'd cast themselves into by allowing hatred and intoler intolerance 
to run the show. And you can say the same thing, you know, about the magnificent achievements of pre-Nazi Germany, followed by the devastation that followed that. So, you know, it seems to be a lesson that we're particularly thick as a species about learning. Up and down like a roller coaster. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I guess for me, all those years of covering people in crisis, I became really fascinated by who people become in a crisis. And some people are drawn towards their worst self. And I guess that's more what you would expect to see. But mm -hmm. it's so often true, also true, and almost equally true, that a lot of people are drawn towards their best self. That's right. And they find a kind of a level of kindness and heroism that they probably... And, you know, I even think about it in terms of 9-11. One of the stories from that day that stuck with me were the people who were trapped in the, the lift. And some of them were gazillionaire financiers and CEOs and all that. But the guy that got them out was the window washer who wouldn't give in. And all he had was his squeegee, and he worked his way through the plasterboard relentlessly, and then everybody lived who otherwise would have died. And I often think about him and wonder if he went off to work that day knowing what a hero he had inside him. And if he hadn't been caught in that catastrophe, he might have lived his whole life and never known it. We'd all like to think we would react that way. I, I think know. you can't know till it comes to you. You know? absolutely yeah. can't know. But there's a lot of strength in your characters, and there's a lot of really strong women characters. Now, I heard you today at PCC define yourself as a, oh, let's see, what was it? A feminist, feminist tree-hugging tree pinko. pinko. <laughs> you think that gets about everything? I do. <laughs> feminist tree-hugging pinko. Talk to us about your feminist tree-hugging pinko heroines. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I'm drawn to... How autobiographical? To... That's the question I always get. Yeah, no, they're not really, but what I... One of the other things we talked about today is where do you find voices for people who were often excluded from having a voice? in their own society. And we all know that women's voices and black voices, Native American voices, are wildly underrepresented in the historical record. So when I'm thinking about the past, I'm always thinking about those missing voices and trying to figure out ways to hear them. And one of the things that I learned in researching my first novel is that if a woman is um, not allowed to become literate. And if she doesn't have skills to write, or even if she did theoretically have skills to write, she doesn't have the time to write because she's laboring from before sun up till after sundown. So when does she get to write her exquisitely crafted ponces? Well, she didn't, but you can hear her voice very often in verbatim court testimony particularly in the little local courts where they just took down every word and they didn't have very strict rules of evidence, so there'd be wild um, digression from the subject at hand. And you really can get to know these women and how they think. And often how they think is that they're being intensely abused and put upon by the system in which they're living. So. You often find sensibility there that we think of as very modern, but that's just, I think, our egotism as modern Western feminists to think that we were the first ones that had this bright idea that maybe things were somewhat unequal. Well, women knew that in the 17th century. I'm sure they did. <laughs> I'm confident they did. Um, interesting. Obviously, a lot of research in your work um, that would be the fun part for me, mm -hmm. and of mm -hmm. course it would. Um, so, so talk to us a little bit about, about how you go about your research and, and you know, what, what it sometimes brings you. I'm sure that you don't always end up where you thought you might mm -mm. as you began. Yeah. Is that a fair statement? Hardly ever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm, 
usually for me, I've got an architecture of the known fact, but where the story is going to go and what the characters are going to be like happens along the way. But I got a great piece of advice. Um, I'd written two books of nonfiction before I decided to take the jump off the ledge into fiction, and um, I met Charles Frazier, who wrote one of my favorite books called Mountain, and he gave me a great piece of advice because that book, I think it took him 14 years to write. And one of the reasons, he said, was that he got lost in the research. He loved libraries so much that he would just go there and read these things that fascinated him, whether or not they had any relevance <laughs> to the story. And finally, his wife, who is an accountant, started to take a very dim view of this, and she said, Chuck, We've got a new rule as of today. You're only allowed to go to the library when you can show me a list of three things that you need to know. And when you've found those three things, you have to come home and write them. And that's how he got Coal Mountain finished. So I took that to heart. And um, my, my modus operandi is to read enough from the period until I can hear a voice speaking to me. And who that voice is, how that voice sounds, tells me who that character is. And who they are tells me how they're going to act. And that sets the plot in motion. And then as the plot moves, I'll very quickly come to something I don't know. Um, a banal example, she's getting undressed. What's she wearing? <laughs> mm -hmm. And then I have to go and find out what she would wear, be wearing, what the undergarments were, and things like that. And then after she's uh, undressed, she goes to bed. But what kind of bed, you know? And then you find out that in colonial America, it would have been called a shakedown, and it would have been, you know, ticking stuffed with whatever they had to hand, bone husks, or, you know, so that kind of detail. I find out when I need it because the story has told me that I need to know it rather than letting the research drive the story. I think we all know a lot more about um, uh, the art of, of painting and reproduction than we ever did before, <laughs> before we read your book about, about grinding the pigments and all that. That was fascinating. And particularly the sections about the different kinds of, of, of parchment. Did you guys know that? I didn't know any of that. I thought it was fascinating. Anyway, I love the colors. I got really yeah. The colors were great. That was that was a you know a dangerous hole I could have gone a long way down into because every single one of the colors had such a great story behind it. It did. So. It did. It was it was amazing. <laughs> and then learning to make gold leaf that was cool because I actually went and tried to make some and it's it my work. gold leaf kept blowing all over. The <laughs> I thought maybe you were going to say, and now you have Persian cats. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, but it's, it's great. But um, one of the things that was intriguing to me, and I know intriguing to a number of people in our audience because they've spoken to me of it, is, is this, um, this difficulty of, uh, difficulty is not the right word, but the complexity of, of having Hannah drive the story this way, and, and, the, and also in that, having us go this way back into history and flipping mm. from period to period to period and trying to keep all of those very discreet and wonderful stories and characters developed and, and true to themselves and just straight in your mind. How did you come up with that technique of driving the story? Well, I started at the end with this book. I wrote the story of the artist first. Really? Because that was, to me, the greatest mystery of the book was who made it and why. Mm -hmm. Why at a time when figurative art was frowned on um, in much of the Jewish world because of the commandment against making graven images or likenesses of anything. Mm -hmm. Why did somebody suddenly burst forth into this wonderful artistic expression? Um, and so thinking about that was the first problem that I wanted to solve. But then I realized that it would be more intriguing as a story to walk backwards towards that through all the other more contemporary 
um, people of this particular book, the various protectors and so forth, and then work the way back to the creator. Um, not a popular choice in my household. My husband found this completely confounding and unnecessary complex. <laughs> he kept saying, this would be such a better book if you just started at the beginning and went forward. <laughs> I don't know that's true. <laughs> Maybe. One person's opinion. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, um, it was amazing to me how you were able to sort of wrap all that together. I thought it was, was um, really intriguing. Certainly something that, um, that captured. It was a good hook, <laughs> I thought. Good hook. So, so that's, um, that's good for all of us. So, so what's next? Oh, I have taken a deep dive back. How long did it take you to write this? Because oh. you, you said at one time that you were sort of interrupted by it, and then and then I and had trouble with it. It was it was driving me crazy. A lot of things weren't working. Um, Year of Wonders had been a very happy experience because I'd spent ten years thinking about the material before I sat down to write it and. It was a very contained story of one year in the life of this village with a set cast of characters. And then, my you know, and for my next trick, <laughs> I will travel through five centuries and, you know, we will, we will uh, investigate five different cultures and whoops. And it wasn't going very well. So I had a couple of parts of the book in draft form, but I couldn't quite get the connective tissue. And then the idea for March flew in the window gift wrapped. And so I had to have a very uncomfortable conversation with my editor saying, you know that book? <laughs> Not quite I'm, ready for that. I'm going to put it in the drawer and I'm going to do this other book and are you okay with that? And, um, and so that's what happened. And then when I finished March, um, three years, I guess two and a half years later, I opened the drawer with some trepidation and took the material out, not knowing what I was going to think about it. And then I guess it had been sort of fermenting away by itself because when I sat down with it again, it became very clear to me what the problems were and what I had to do. I'm sure that's intimidating to pick up something that you've written. You, you're not really sure Gee, did I did I get that right? Did I did I say that right? I'm sure you're your own worst critic. Well, I actually it was a relief because I actually liked um, the two sections that I'd completed, and then I really hated the narrator's voice because I hadn't captured it. So I had to toss that idea and come up with a different narrator. And so you gave her an Australian voice. Yes, because <laughs> I didn't have to go to the library to get that one. <laughs> Oh, there's but, a time saver. Yeah, but then not so much because she became, in a very Australian way, well, I don't know if you've had the experience of the Australian house guest who comes for the weekend and you turn around a month later and they're still on your couch. <laughs> she kind of barged into the book and instead of being a kind of a nice connective tissue that would lead us from one bit to the next, she demanded her own narrative, and she kind of bossy booted me into telling her story as well. <laughs> that seems in character for her. <laughs> it seems in character. So I, I, I digress from what we were talking about before, which is what is next? Do you have another project on the? On the I ground? am working on something. It's set in Stone Age Israel. Hmm. <laughs> wow! You just keep going back and back. Don't you? Um. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, that's great. Uh, Any advice for aspiring authors? I know we have several authors in the audience. Oh, well, I think that um, the beauty of being a novelist is that you can come at it from any previous experience whatsoever. There's no prescribed course of study or career path for it, which is very useful and anything that you've done so far is going to be helpful to you in writing and my particular path through journalism I think was extremely useful and all those 
tools that I got to add to the toolbox during those journalistic years, starting from my very, very first job in journalism. I wanted to be a journalist from a very early age, and uh, so when I went to college, I thought, well, what would be useful? And I looked in the paper, and I saw there was a lot of politics, so I studied government. And I also saw there was a tremendous amount of cultural coverage, so I thought fine arts might be of some use. And so I got my degree, and I arrived at my first job as a cub reporter, tremendously well informed about the uses of tempera and quattrocento painting and <laughs> classical <laughs> political theory from Plato to Hobbes. And they sent me to the sports department to cover the races. <laughs> But this turned out to be excellent. I mean, not cover them in some wonderful Damon Runyon sense of <laughs> writing colorful stories about the track. No, I didn't get to do that. My job was to take down what they called the details about every horse in every race, what the odds were, what they went out to, what they started at, where the horse was at the turn, where at the finish, what was the condition of the track. And it was just reams and reams of data that the senior writers could use. Uh, in their stories, and what it gave you was a tremendous respect for little detail and fact, mm -hmm. because one of the things that you had to do in that job was, after all the race meetings, was go back to the newspaper and look at the first edition and check the results, because in those Neanderthal pre-internet days, Rural bookmakers paid out on the results that were printed in the first edition of the Herald. And if I had made a mistake, uh -huh. I would be terminated. Yeah. <laughs> and not just from my job, so... And um, probably a lot poorer. Yes, so... Yeah. Uh, you had to make that good. It, it made me very careful about facts, and you wouldn't think that that would be useful for a fiction writer, but it really is, because they're like the scaffolding into which you pour the concrete of the imagination, if you like. And sometimes, when you take away that formwork, you want to let some of the marks of the formwork still show, sure. because it gives you know, confidence to your reader that you know what you're talking about. But other times, you'll take away the formwork and there'll be no sign that it was ever there because the imaginative thing will have filled up the space. So I guess um, the other, only other advice is just do it. Um, and that was another great lesson of journalism because you've got to write. You've got to write, you've got to file that story. There's a deadline every day. And you, the mo juste not arriving, Tell that to your desk. <laughs> They're not going to be very impressed with that. So it makes me feel like that there can be no such thing as writer's block any more than you talk about hairdresser's block or bricklayer's block. You just have to get on with it and get on with it and do it. And sometimes um, you'll build a really good wall and sometimes it'll be a terrible wall and you'll have to come in the next day and knock it over, but every day you have to build. It's practice, practice, practice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're going to accept questions from the audience. I think someone is collecting those, if I'm not mistaken, um, because in, in, in working with Ms. Brooks today, I noticed that um, one of her um, strongest presentations were, was in response to the questions that came from you, the audience members, and we want to leave enough time for that to happen. So, Christine, the, um, the multi-talented Christine is bringing up some questions. And we will <laughs> see what we have, what you have to say and to ask. It's a long walk, I apologize, <laughs> it's a long walk. Just a few things that we've already talked about. Do you remember that one? Oh, yes. Talk about the Catholic priest and the rabbi. Ah, the yeah. 1609 approval of the book, of the book itself. Yeah, remember we, when he signed off on the book. Yeah, That's we talked about, about this today um, with the students, but um, I'm happy to tell that story again because, so, it's really a wonderful time to be doing what I do because you can find so much 
on the internet from the comfort of your own home between Google and JSTOR. You can get all kinds of wonderful scholarly articles on obscure subjects. But there's nothing can be done really without also, I think, beating a path to the stacks of a great library. Because it's only there that you can have the serendipitous encounter with the thing that you didn't know you were looking for. Right. And the case in People of the Book was um, in 1609, we know this book was in Venice because uh, a censor, a, a priest from the office of the Pope's Inquisition, had to decide whether the book should be burned or saved. And he wrote an inscription on uh, the parchment saying, Rivisto per me. Um, inspected by me, and he signed his name, um, Domenico Visterini, and put the date. And so my question was, why did he say that? Why did he say that there was nothing against the church? Because there is actually quite a bit against the church, or what the church at that time would have found heretical. And so I wondered about Domenico Visterini, and his motives, and whether he'd just been moved by the beauty of this book and couldn't bring himself to condemn it. And I wanted to find out about who these um, censors of Hebrew books were. So I was researching that in the stacks of Widener Library, and I couldn't find out anything about him. All we know about him is the, the books that we have today, because they have his, uh, his signature and, and his uh, assertion that there's nothing wrong with them but of his life and who he was and what motivated him, nothing. But while I was in those stacks, it was as if he was there and he tapped me on the shoulder and said, go look over there, you'll, you'll find me through somebody else's eyes. Because in the next shelf, there were books about uh, Jewish life in 17th century Venice. And mm -hmm. one of the books was an autobiography that I hadn't known anything about. Uh, by a rabbi called Leo de Medina, Leon de Medina, and he actually had to take Hebrew books to the office of the Pope's Inquisition to be read and censored. And so he had a whole discussion of what that was like and you know how nerve-wracking it was and his relationships with the priest. So I started to imagine a relationship between a priest and a rabbi in 17th century Venice and two men who were brought together by their love of literature and by intellectual life, but who were also forced apart by the exigencies of their own time and place. Fascinating. Um, someone's asking about um, why, why Hannah and the seed at the end? Uh -huh. Why add the seed? Okay, so at the end of the book, and this is completely fanciful, this is uh, imagination on overdrive, the book goes briefly to Australia. And Hannah takes the seed of a Morton Bay fig tree, which is a very common tree around the harbor of Sydney. And it's a tiny, tiny little seed. And Smaller she, than a mustard seed? About the same. And she drops it into the binding of the book. And I imagine that that is her messing with the head of some book conservator of the future. <laughs> who will find this seed and wonder how it got there and try and piece together how an Australian tree seed could have got into the binding of the book. And it was inspired by the fact that conservators always leave work for another generation to do because techniques improve all the time, the same way archaeologists leave part of every dig unexcavated for the techniques of the future. Someone's curious about what made you juxtapose the two stories, that is, the story of the book's history and the story of the mother and daughter. <laughs> well, I think that was really just um, an accident, actually. There was no, no big theme going on there. It just happened that um, because Hannah became a more important character, this relationship grew into, you know, a monster. And, 
because I was writing about somebody for the first time who was from my own time and place, I wanted for the novelistic challenge to make her as different from me as possible. So I gave her a completely different background in every respect. Um, and because my mum has always been my best friend, I decided to give her a terrible mother, or <laughs> at least a mother who she was incapable of viewing objectively, and that they had a poisonous relationship, because I thought it would be fun to write about something so different from my own experience. <laughs> <laughs> and your mother but, appreciated that, I'm sure. But then I, had to, uh, I got invited to go and speak at the... Um, neurosurgical conference in San Diego and I was pretty abashed having to face down a room of all these very accomplished women neurosurgeons who were all excellent mothers, I have no doubt. <laughs> and I told them the truth, which was I, I actually went and interviewed friends of mine who I knew had trouble, troubled relationships with their mothers about what that had been like and how did it express itself. And so the closest model for this um, relationship was not a neurosurgeon at all. The, the mother that I based a lot of these incidents on was actually a poet. <laughs> Someone wants to know, doesn't historical fiction, underline, mislead our readers about past realities? Oh, I don't think so, because I don't think readers are, you know, basically dumb. <laughs> Um, I think when you put the, the words a novel on the cover, you pretty much got a, a pass there. But what I do like to do is um, have an afterword that shows what the factual basis of this story is, how much we know, and then comes clean on where the flights of fancy begin and end. And so I've done that with all my novels because I like it when historical novelists do that. Um, I find that it increases my enjoyment to know what's made up and what's true. And I also like to give some sources that people can go to because I like to think of historical fiction as the gateway drug to history because it worked that way for me. When I was young, I read Mary Renault's remarkable books about the ancient world. And I didn't have a classical education or anything, but those books drove me to go and learn more about ancient Greece, and um, I felt very much enriched by that. Have you traveled to the spots in the book? In Have you traveled to those locations? In um, People of the Book? People of the Book. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it was such a hardship having to go to Venice. I found I had to research that angel hair pasta with the truffle shavings extensively. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, here's, a, here's a question, a joint question. Talk about how both you and your husband are able to work on your craft. Huh. Together? <laughs> separate offices? Well, now, in our later and perhaps slightly more prosperous years, yes, we do have separate <laughs> offices. But for a long time, we shared not only a room, but a computer. So that was what you might call stressful. <laughs> but luckily now, he has his own space because he's much messier than I am. <laughs> and he says he knows where everything is, but it's not possible when you look at that room that he could possibly know where everything is. Um, and it has its, it's mostly upsides um, because we're each other's editor and last resort. Nothing, we use each other to bat around ideas and then nothing goes out of the house until it's been read and critiqued and uh, we know each other's foibles so you can't, he, he always goes through my books and underlines every use of the word desiccated. <laughs> <laughs> so now I just put them in there to annoy him. <laughs> Seems fair to me. Um, and, you know, on the days when one of you is having a really productive writing day and the other one maybe not so much, it can be really annoying if you hear him tip, 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 and you're sitting there. You know, but uh, mostly good. 
Good. Good. Why, why the title? Someone wanted to know. Why people of the book? Oh, well, it's an expression um, that I first came across uh, in the Muslim world, uh, in Arabic, Ahl al-Khatib, the people of the book, refers to um, the three faiths who sh share a commitment to a, a scripture, a work of scripture, obviously Muslims of Quran, um, Jews, uh, the Hebrew Bible, and Christians, the Old and New Testament, and um, all of those people in Islamic law are people of the book, which means that they're entitled to special consideration. But also Jews consider themselves the people of the book also, uh -huh. and you know, rightly so, because when you're in synagogue and the service reaches its climax, what do you do? You bow to a book. So, um, and then it has just the plain meaning that this is the story of the people of this particular book, the creators and protectors. Well, um, I hope that each of you, through your attendance here tonight, feels that you are a person of the book, and a person of books, <laughs> and a lover of books. Uh, we very much enjoy, we at the library very much enjoy bringing you one city, one story every year. I hope you'll stay tuned to see whatever it is that we will have in store for you for our 11th year. Um, but before we, before we exit, um, two things I want to say. John, you want to come up and make your announcement? Uh, John Price is the membership director for the Friends of the Library. Um, you didn't think you were getting out completely with that commercial, did you? Um, so he, he has just a word he would like to say. Thank you. I know that we all like to be somebody's friend. And the Pasadena Library has a lot of them. We call ourselves the Friends of the Pasadena Public Library. And through our membership donations, our book sales and the bookstore that we run at Central, we are able to help the library fund a number of programs ranging all the way from story time for tiny children to an adult event like this. We're one of the partners of One City, One Story. If you would like more information about becoming a member of the Friends of the Pasadena Public Library, I'll be circulating around one of the exits here with some materials. I'll be glad to give you one of our newsletters. And we'd love to have you join us. And we'd love to have you know more about the uh, Friends of the Pasadena Public Library. Thanks. Thank you, John. Thank you again for coming. We appreciate your support. We appreciate your attention. We appreciate your reading. And, and you're being a part of this wonderful community of readers that we call home. If you would like to have Ms. Brooks sign your copy of, of People of the Book or another of her titles, please line up in the central aisle, and she'll be seated just over here at a table and is happy to do that. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next year.